Uh, welcome everyone to our CHC um, happy hour coffee chat. Uh, we are so privileged to have Anne McKay as our speaker for today. She's the past president of the Central Council for Homeopathic for a Council for Homeopathic Certification. And uh, I'm not going to read off all the degrees behind her name, but I'll give you an, an overview of all the experience she has, over 30 years of experience as a registered nurse, as an educator, and as a homeopath. She's board certified as a psychiatric mental health nurse, which is her RNBC. She's a holistic nurse, which is her HNBC, certified classical homeopath, CCH. She's a health and wellness nurse coach, and she served as a president of our Council for Homeopathic Certification, from 2011 through 2017, and it was during her tenure that she brought a passion for accreditation of homeopathic practitioners, which included the successful initiative for accreditation of the CCH credential through the National Commission for Certifying Agencies, which is the NCCA. And she was responsible for the completion of the first CHC job analysis and implementation of the computerized application examination and recertification processes. And I was privileged enough to work with her on that job analysis committee. And Anne, you'll remember our late meetings, our bi-monthly meetings, which would go on. They were so much fun, but we got a lot of work done and that is responsible for the current exam that we have. So we are so grateful to you for that. Um, Anne was awarded the President Emeritus for the Council for Homeopathic Certification as a result of these efforts to achieve the accreditation for the CHC credential. Between 2004 and 2010, Anne served as faculty member and clinical supervisor for several colleges and homeopathic schools. And she currently coaches the CCH homeopaths with their difficult cases as well as other holistic nurses in building their holistic nursing education as well as business. So she brings to us over 30 years of experience and she's gonna to talk to us about how healthcare professionals other than those that are homeopaths can incorporate homeopathy in their practice and can get certified and what the scope of practice is for all of us CCHs in states that have and in states that don't have the health freedom laws. So I'm so pleased and honored to give you guys Anne. And please take it away. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Yashi. Um, <laughs> that was very um, overdone, but uh, thank you. I, um, I think it was underdone. I beg to differ. <laughs> and I could sit here and talk the whole hour, this happy hour about you. But you know, well, we thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, it's nice to see a lot of uh, people here who some names I know and some names I don't. Um, I'm assuming that some of you are certified and some of you are not. And that's that uh, several healthcare professionals might be here, I hope, uh, so that I can uh, gear my what I have to say to you to entice you to uh, consider being certified as a homeopath. You know, as I was meditating about what I was going to say today, um, I recollected uh, a seminar I attended in uh, about 30 some years ago with Dr. Andrew Wheel, who at the time uh, wasn't, was just getting integrative medicine off on the map and off uh, the books. And uh, one thing that stuck out in my mind, and I believe it was at an American holistic nurses conference that he was uh, the speaker. Uh, he was talking at that time about holism, you know, what is holistic medicine? What's complementary and alternative medicine? What, how do these things work in, in traditional or allopathic medicine? And I, I recollect very clearly that he said, uh, all, of, all of these modalities or therapeutics do not focus on what is important, and that is patient-centered care and using everything we have at our disposal to help uh, clients and patients. And that stuck in my head for over 30 or 40 years. And it was at that time that I was um, uh, chapter leader for the state of Rhode Island 
<clears throat> for the American Holistic Nurses Association. And uh, one of my goals at the time was to bring homeopathy into holistic nursing, which they weren't ready for. And I don't think we were ready for either. It was just premature on my part. But one of my passions has always been to get homeopathy within the, the international and national healthcare setting. And so that's one of the big pushes I had for all out massive action to get the CCH credential accredited, which we did in 16 and it was just reaccredited this year. Um, so one of the things I wanna talk about is what happened between when Dr. Wheel talked talked about that many years ago in the 1990s. It was probably mid nineties when I heard that. And today in terms of integrative healthcare and integrative medicine, and that is the National Institutes of Health uh, recognize what they used to call complementary and alternative medicine. It was the National uh, Commission for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which has now changed. Um, it's now uh, integrative medicine, but it's, it's on the website for, um, for the government uh, NIH website. And, and there are five specific therapeutics that are considered um, integrative. And uh, I'll start with the last one, which is ours, <laughs> whole health systems, which is homeopathy, Ayurvedic. Those are systems that have come along and been independent holistic medical systems uh, that have flourished and over the years and have been around for quite a, a while. They're still considered in the United States, uh, not as much in Canada as um, traditional and emerging professions. <laughs> I don't think homeopathy is an emerging profession, but apparently uh, the NIH does. Excuse me. I'm just getting over some kind of a bug and don't want to lose my voice here. Um, so, you know, homeopathy fits very nicely into the integrative uh, healthcare uh, landscape. And part of, part of what I see is that the CACH credential can help us get there as well. Um, once we are accredited as a credential, then we can take that and use it to get into hospitals, clinics, uh, offices, and, and other traditional and allopathic and conventional medicine to be incorporated and used, uh, as I said, in whatever way is possible for the patient or the client. Um, I don't have a lot of faces here, but as a sh do we have a, an idea of how many people here are certified working to become homeopaths, just interested in? Um, um, I think Michelle, uh, she on a daily basis uh, talks to people who reach out and they are in different stages of preparing for the exam or just finding out about it or those that have taken the exam but have not maybe cleared it and are retaking the exam. So, but she has the numbers. So we would be able to give those to you. Um, what's okay. the yeah, I, I see a couple of people here who I, I know are, um, are certified and then I see some names that are not familiar. So um, the other part of this is, uh, it seems to me that many of the other um, methods that the NIH approves as integrative medicine, one of which is mind-body um, and another, which is uh, biomanipulative, are well used. Chiropractic is one, uh, massage therapy and reflexology are others. Um, unfortunately, homeopathy is viewed as um, not evidence-based, although we know that it certainly, we have a lot of research. Uh, it is not the type of research over the past few years that um, the regular medical people like to see. And so that's the argument that I've heard uh, over many years. And 
Iris Bell and others have been instrumental in getting us where we need to go with, with all of that. Uh, I mean, you know, one of the things that have happened over the last couple of years is I've seen where, such as uh, the time of the fires in California, they were looking for homeopaths and they chose CCH homeopaths. If you didn't have your CCH, uh, you wouldn't be able to work to take care of uh, people who are victims of the fires. So I see we're starting to get ahead little by little uh, into conventional medicine. And, and it isn't that it's them or us. Uh, it's the approach of focusing on what's best for the patient's lifestyle, the patient's issues, and focusing on prevention, wellness, healing, rather than finding what the disease is and treating the disease. Um, I, I've spent 40, 45 years actually uh, in homeopathy, holistic nursing in a private practice. I've just closed my office not quite a year ago um, so that I could spend more time focusing on a little bit of research and writing and working with doctors and nurses and whoever I, I can who will listen, who's a health professional about homeopathy and bringing that into uh, the forefront. We had a couple of uh, opportunities to speak with Brown University Medical uh, Director for Family Medicine to see if they might put a, a six month program in for uh, you know their students who might be interested in uh, taking homeopathy just as they would take another subspecialty for family medicine. Uh, and it's slow going, but it gets there little by little. I see it happening. Um, one of the other areas that I consider homeopathy to be part of, but the NIH doesn't, is energy medicine. And several years ago, as uh, president of the Homeopathic Nurses Association, I did a research study with a task force on every state board of nursing and what they considered scope of practice for homeopathy. Uh, this was back in 2003, perhaps. And at the time, some of the states didn't even understand. They thought I was asking about herbal medicine. And um, several of the states, such as New York, said, uh, you can't do anything. And it, I don't care if you're certified, not certified. In New York, you can't practice homeopathy. And we do have many uh, practitioners in homeopathy, and they seem to be okay. But uh, I also wonder many times what would happen if in New York people could practice who was a prof health professional that is not a physician. You know, we have great nurse practitioners, we have great nurses, we have great other healthcare practitioners who are um, not ho homeopathically certified. And that's important for scope of practice with each of the states. Do you want me to admit people, Yashi, or do you? I'll just go, okay. Yeah, I'm taking care of that. Okay, Don't thank you. Um, where was I, let's see. Um, you were talking about the state of New York and if people were able to practice in New York. I had another experience with Connecticut as well. Uh, the Department of Health wanted us to, uh, the CHC, to come in and discuss things. And there was a physician on that Board of Health that was grilling me, it was like the Inquisition. <laughs> and the facilitator of the uh, of that particular meeting said, could you just give her a chance and slow down and stop badgering her before she finishes what she has to say? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, it was obvious to me that he certainly either didn't understand or his awareness of homeopathy wasn't where it needed to be to allow uh, people in Connecticut as consumers to be able to utilize um, homeopathic practitioners. You have to work under a physician there. And unfortunately in Massachusetts, 
uh, in 2015, right around the time the FDA uh, had their hearings about homeopathy, the Board of Nursing slid in homeopathy uh, in the holistic nursing practice statute that said you have to work under a physician if you're a homeopathic nurse, which um, sent me reeling because up to then it hadn't been. And I spent quite a bit of time and energy trying to write letters and get to talk to them, but they had already set the stage. Um, so, you know, we find that we have 11 health freedom states. Uh, many of them, uh, even if you are a healthcare professional, you need to have this within your scope of practice or show that you um, have advanced knowledge of it, which the CHC certification would provide. Sorry, my voice is going here. Um, let me think of what else, I have a couple of notes here. So just, just looking at what's called integrative today, as I think about the last 30 years and where we've come from, you know, integrative medicine being considered holistic or complementary, it's an expansive process and that includes not only the client's issues, but their lifestyle uh, and it's mind, body, soul, environmental, social, spiritual, it includes everything. And that means we use everything at our disposal to take care of the patient. We don't say throw out medicine. We don't say we're gonna throw out, uh, if you're you know, using traditional medicine, you can't use integrative medicine. It's all part of one thing and it should be multidisciplinary. And that's still, <coughs> excuse me, that's still a hard, um, a hard thing to crack. It's happening little by little, but it hasn't fully come to bloom where a multidisciplinary team works together to take care of the client. <coughs> Excuse me. You know what, Yashi? I'm I can tell my voice is just not going to make it. Maybe we should open it up for some questions that I can answer. Sure. And, yes, um, absolutely. So okay. I will, uh, let me just um, unmute it. Yes. So I'm going to just read some of the messages that have <coughs> Excuse um, me. So we have Leah Nelson here. She's a homeopath. Hi, Leah. Welcome. She graduated from the IACH just this August, but she's not certified through the CHC and she lives in Utah. Uh, Leah, did you have any questions uh, for? Um, and, and you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Sure, I can put my video on too. I'm just getting over a cold myself. <laughs> um, I just, you know, I, I actually spoke with a, a naturopath. I work in her office. She can't even say she's a naturopath right now, but um, that's another story. And she has practiced homeopathy. She, she's been doing it for 20 years and she says she doesn't advertise or market at all. Um, because of the legalities here in mm -hmm. terms of homeopathy. And I was just wondering where would I find, I, it's, uh, it's challenging to find information on what exactly I'm allowed to do and not allowed to do um, in terms of saying what I do or marketing. In terms of being in Utah. Right. So the national, you know, uh, you could call the Department of Health and find out what, what, there is or isn't about practicing homeopathy. Um, but the other thing is the National Health Freedom uh, Action Organization. I think it's, uh, I, I know the address, is, the web address is nationalhealthfreedomaction.com. <clears throat> Has uh, resources for you to use to help get your state a health freedom state. Okay. So you might want to start here because, you know, it's hate, I hate to hear people tell me, and nurses especially too, that they're working under the radar because uh, we have a wonderful art and science in homeopathy and we should be able to use it. And instead what we're doing is, you know, we're hiding out in our offices, treating people. Uh, my office was in Rhode Island for that very reason. We had 
health freedom when I, when I started there. And that's why I decided to stay there. I happened to hook up at the time, uh, 20 some years ago with two physicians, one who was um, a psychiatrist who turned to homeopathy after he had a great experience with uh, Arnica. And uh, the other guy was um, a homeopath from New York who came to Brown to get a medical degree to give him credence. So <laughs> I had two guys who were physicians so it looked to the Department of Health that I was working under a physician, but I really wasn't. We all had our own practices within the uh, office, but it worked out well for me for many years. And um, I, I didn't have any harassment from the state. Uh, so I would say- Did you work in Rhode Island? Yes. Rhode Island is a freedom health state, right? Yes. Yes. and. Um, you know, I get calls all the time for people that want to apply to our school. And even in our own school, lots of people don't know about the Health Freedom Coalition. Right. You know, it's $50 a year. I think it would be really nice to give them a little more publicity so that they can get stronger. Diane Miller has poured her life into this and fought these laws through state by state by state. Yep. So it's really amazing. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to see you here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Diane Miller, I met Diane um, probably back in 2000. She came to speak to the homeopathic nurses meeting. Um, her passion is, is to get uh, homeopathy into the states, the health freedom into all states so that we have choice, and that's very important, especially in this day and age. Uh, so that's one way I, I would suggest you could find out about what Utah allows and, and disallows for medical care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, then I have, next I have Tracy here. Tracy, welcome. Uh, Tracy is in uh, South Carolina. She's an RN, BSN, RRT, RCP. I'm so impressed with her. <laughs> she graduated uh, 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 with homeopathy from the Homeopathy in School International recently. And she is taking her CHC exam in April of 2023. Great. And then uh, Daiva is asking what the 11 health freedom states are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the I typed link. them in. I typed yeah. them in. Yeah. yeah. But I'll send you, I'll also add in the link when, when I get a chance of the National Health Freedom Coalition that everybody's been talking about. So I'll put the link to that website and that has the 11 states and also which year each of them got their health freedom status and what that what was the law that gave them that status so i'll add add that in and thank you barbara for typing up those states <laughs> i can just read them off because i had written them down earlier rhode island oklahoma idaho minnesota california louisiana new mexico arizona both of those states next uh new mexico and arizona have homeopathic medical boards so you would be a, a, an assistant uh, that has, I think it's, you may not have to take a test, but you have to work, your license would be to work under a homeopathic physician. Um, Colorado, Nevada, and I think I missed one. Idaho? I said Idaho. Oklahoma, Minnesota. Oh, Maine is the recent one. Most oh, Maine. Oh, Maine yeah. was 2019. 2019, yes. Uh, yeah. And we have our current uh, president of the CAP, Sheetal Tiwari. She's here and she actually already, she's a step ahead of me. She already has put the link to the National Health Freedom Coalition in our uh, chat. So if you click on that, that gives you all the states as well. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sheetal. Thank I appreciate you. that. Okay. Um, anybody else have any um, questions for Ange? Be happy to answer them. She has so much experience and she's been doing this to get homeopathy recognized and for us to be able to practice legally and safely. So we are so grateful and to you for that. Thank you. I have a question, but I joined late. So if you already discussed this, you don't have to answer it again. Um, I'm in Washington state 
and I know it's not legal to practice here. Um, a lot of homeopaths here who are trying to practice openly are looking at things like uh, registering their business as an LLC in a health freedom state and um, using a registered agent and conducting virtual business only, not seeing in per people in person in their state, things like that. And I was wondering if you had any advice about mm -hmm. how to you know, manage that or navigate that. I guess even that's a little tricky because over time, if people find out you really are in Washington and say you get a client who's in Washington, even if your practice is registered, say in Arizona, you know, you're still technically kind of both in Washington. So it's a little tricky. I, I mean, I moved here last summer and I kind of stopped my practice and I've been slow to get it going again because I just don't feel totally, you know, comfortable openly like advertising or whatnot. Right. So, I know. That's, I know. that's, that's the big issue here. Uh, and there is a, a great Washington homeopathic society. Have you joined? Yes, I have. And I'm going to talk to them a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I know a few years ago, one, one of, um, one of my friends was, um, I don't know if she was on the board, but she was part of that organization and they were working to see if they could get, uh, health freedom passed and there was a glitch uh through the senate you know, i think yes you're right and actually i um within that state you know homeopathy association they have a conference this weekend and they're doing a breakout room on legalities of practice Good. so i had got really excited about oh i want to go to that and they said do you want to help with it and i was like well sure but i don't know what i can tell them other than the things that you can't do so last week i was in a meeting with a couple of people from the state association with diane miller and hmm. they were asking her like what happened with that you know safe harbor law and all that and from what she said um it didn't pass but there's somebody who was in the like state senate or whatnot that was kind of like against homeopathy and would stop you know, all those but we were looking it up just last week and that woman is now gone Great. There's a new person in her place. So Diane was strongly encouraging us as an organization to get it going again. And she said she'd help. So maybe in the next five years, we can get something passed in Washington because it's really a problem here. Yeah, like, I don't know. Uh, it's a problem in many states. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is um, the, the safe harbor laws are better than licensure. You know, when when you when you get acupuncture was, was uh about they were about 15 18 years ahead of us but they went through this whole process and when you have a licensure process then you become um really the handmaiden of the state or the department of health you know uh whereas with with certification or something that shows that you have you're competent that you have the ability to be able to treat clients in an ethical way without having to be licensed for it, to me, is the best of both worlds. And that's what Diane's been working for for years. Yeah, so, that's the freedom. And, yeah. Yeah. It's that freedom that we that we need to keep right uh, and not let go. Uh, Jerry, Jerry Cantor is a, a an acupuncturist homeopath who, who's written a few books and he, his latest book out that he sent an email to me today about, uh, I haven't taken a look at the email totally, uh, has to do with all of this. You know, okay. we're, we're hiding, we're, we're letting- I actually go. got his email today and I didn't look at it yet either, but I saw it and I was oh. like, oh, I wonder what Jerry's doing. Cause I was on his email list from before, but right. Right. Oh, good, I'm glad you mentioned that. So I'll actually yeah. read it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, thank you. I wish I could be- Give you yeah, that's okay. And then another quick question. Have you talked at all? Or do you know about um, people keep telling me like, well, you should register as a private membership association. I don't know if you know much about that. But I've kind of looked into it. And I'm not 100% convinced it would totally protect me if mm -hmm. someone tried to sue me for practicing homeopathy in Washington. So I'm probably not going to do that. But I, it's becoming a little more popular that um, some of the newer graduates are all getting into this PMA stuff. And I just don't know if anyone in this group here on the call has any information about that. I don't. Does anyone else know? I, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Well, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Um, did anybody else have any questions? Um, if not, I have one question. And when I remember when we talked about putting this, um, having this uh, happy hour on this topic, I had asked you about 
about the remedies because that's something that that I get asked a lot, especially with the new graduates and also with the new homeopaths that come in from other countries and start and want to start practicing here. So obviously, I always recommend the NCH become a member of the National Center of Homeopathy, become a member of NASH, and then of course get certified with through the CHC. But what what would like what is safe and what is not safe in getting remedies, dispensing remedies, keeping remedies in in your like office, giving them out from there, mailing them. Like if you can touch upon that, I think that is a topic that I think everybody has questions on. So when I first started, um, I was I was I have probably. Um, a seven foot tall cabinet with my remedies. And as time went on, I used to actually pop, pop pills in people's mouths as they were in the office. I don't do that anymore because I don't use um, dry method, but uh, what's happened and I've seen happen over the years is number one, it's, it's more difficult to give the remedies ourselves if, if you're not a healthcare professional, even with the CCH. Uh, and one of the best ways is sometimes to either suggest that the client order them or set up a, a you know, some kind of a, an account with there's OHM, there's um, Washington Homeopathics. Uh, they're two good companies that will put up, put, send out the remedies for you to clients. Uh, another way is for you to mail them, but you should be sure they're labeled. They're labeled with potency. They're labeled with the name. Sometimes that, you know, sets someone off too. If you give them arsenicum, you, know, you have family members talking about them being poisoned. So uh, part of part of what you have to do is figure out what goes on in your state and how. Uh, like in New York, I'd be very careful. I wouldn't. I wouldn't give sun remedies myself. I would suggest that they purchase remedies from a reputable homeopathic pharmacy. Um, Highlands, yeah. used, standard process used to be one of my go-tos and they're, they've totally revamped everything and you can't even buy single remedies from them anymore. So, you know, it's, it's things like that that I see happening that as time is going on, we, I think we need to be a little bit more careful with remedies. Can I say something about that, Anne? Sure. Um, so health food stores sell remedies. That's completely legal. So what we suggested to our students at some point was to just get a sales tax license in their city and sell the remedies. And you would make a separate, you know, write a separate invoice for the remedy. And then you have to declare that as your income. But, um, but then it's like any health food store would do. By the way, Barbara, thank you. This is Barbara Sidenek. She's the uh, director of the Homeopathic School International who's been around a long time. She was, her school was sort of uh, accredited, I think before I became president of the CHC, long before, and she's been involved with uh, keeping homeopathy alive, not only with the school, but with other organizations. She's now president of the Council for uh, homeopathy schools and colleges. So thank you for being on, Barbara. We're getting more organized. Yeah. More. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. We really appreciate it. Uh, okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Because if we don't have any questions, then what we can do is we can, I can do my formal thank you for Anne. We can stop recording and then we can have like an informal chat, which doesn't need to be recorded because I'm sure there are some questions that you know, or there's some discussions we want, but we don't want it to be recorded exactly. So uh, this is your last call. If you have a question that you think and could answer, that would be helpful to other people because this recording will be up on our channel and on our website. Um, so you can ask that. And, and if you can think of anything else that you think might be useful uh, to uh, new homeopaths that are coming into this country or homeopaths that are, uh, thinking of getting certified or other professionals that are thinking of getting certified, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Any final words of wisdom for us? Uh -huh. 
that's uh, uh, we yeah. I really believe that the key to raising awareness and to keeping homeopathy alive in the states and in Canada in Canada Ontario has um, reg, reg, regulation which is what we call licensure but in the other provinces it is not uh, regulated but uh, they are more aware and I think they're more welcoming of homeopathy than we are here. But to keep it going, we really need to have certified homeopaths. That's, that's what says I'm competent. Uh, I, you know, I took a test that says uh, that, that is valid and reliable and legally defensible in a court of law. And I think that's important because uh, if someone does want to sue you and you're not certified, you have no recourse except to deal with the Department of Health yourself. And many years ago, I know there was a nurse practitioner in, Cal I think he was in California, who uh, was lost his, his license from the Department of Health because he was practicing homeopathy. And they said he wasn't, he wasn't qualified and he was, but he wasn't certified, that's for sure. But it was thousands of dollars of legal legal fees that he had to uh, come up against. There's only been one or two in that I recall who have been sued uh, for practicing homeopathy in states where it wasn't accepted, and that's over a 25 year period. So uh, I think they're few and far between. Thankfully. Thank you so, so much, Anne. We really, really appreciate your time and everything that you've done for our profession. And we are so very grateful to you again. Thank you so much for being our speaker at this um, happy hour. Thank you so much. Anne. Thank you. Thank you all. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. I've been trying for a little while, but I was driving before. Uh, I don't know if you can answer it. So I am a registered certified homeopath in Ontario, in Canada, and I'm also a registered nurse. Uh, I do have a small practice, but my question is really, what's the similarity between the licensing, uh, the, the licensing process and CHC? Because I was interested in doing the CHC certification but I think they might be very, very similar. And I'm wondering if there's any ability to um, uh, make it quicker to become a CHC certified homeopath as well when you're already licensed. So when uh, regulation was going in in Ontario 2011 and 12, I met with Basil Ziv because my idea was if someone was uh, CHC qualified, could, could the um, TCO take them and, and uh, give them uh, regular licensure, whatever their registration is called. And uh, at the time, uh, they were just getting set up and he said, no, we're not ready for that. It doesn't match, but it does match in a lot of ways. There's just a few things uh, that I noticed that were different for Ontario than what we had for the CHC. But I have, I don't know if that ball was dropped over time and, you know, it just never uh, came to fruition at all. Chital would have a better idea of where that all stands. But isn't it like those are two different things, right? I mean, if you have a C CCH, you have uh, passed the exam. You have reached the highest standard in homeopathic education that we have. You get a lot, a nice boost of confidence from having done that. And, uh, and you enter the homeopathic community more in, you know, in listings, referrals. So if I refer someone, I refer them to a CCH homeopath. So that's different. I'm not familiar with the nurse licensing and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not familiar that much with what happens in Canada. But I think being a CCH is just really for the homeopathic community, right? It is, but I think, I think the issue here is if, if she's regulated by Ontario, by the TCO in Ontario, um, then it's saying that she's qualified 
as a homeopath and her scope of practice in nursing is, is also then considered part of that. Is that right? Is that where no. it's at? Oh, no. Okay. Separate. It, it wouldn't matter whether I was a registered nurse or not. It has nothing to do with the, the certification process that um, the regulatory College of Homeopaths of Ontario require an exam, three case studies, uh, a, um, there's an oral interview. Um, it, it's basically the same process that the CCH process. It's a you must be a classical homeopath. You must pass all their their criteria, and you also pay about uh, I think it was it was about eight hundred or nine hundred dollars uh, to do wow. that. Wow! So for somebody who is already licensed and regulated in that in the province of Ontario, we've already done the majority of what you would do for CCH, as far as I understand. That's why I'm asking for. Um, reciprocity i guess um and i'm wondering if it could be considered who would how would we put this forward because i'm quite interested in in going forward with this so my suggestion is to contact uh shital tuari who's the president of chc and ask that it be considered shital are you still on no i think she got off um because the board of directors of the chc would have to uh discuss that and also uh you know i don't know what ontario has any longer i know what it was eight ten years ago um but i'm not sure if things have changed okay okay, okay. thank you yeah so Annalise, uh, in the chat we have the office admins email address so if you want to use that email you can put in your uh, suggestion about the reciprocity. So that email is chcinfo at homeopathicdirectory.com. It's in the chat. So if you go ahead and email, then you know that can be definitely considered, I think. Okay, thank you. I have one last question and then I'm gonna say my final thank you and then we'll open it up to like our informal chat. Uh, we have a homeopath here from India, Veena. Uh, she has graduated from um, the Homeopathic Medical College in India, and she is right now in Mississippi. So she has the same question that can she practice homeopathy if she does, if she gets certified to the CHC as a CCH? So having your, your CCH um, does not supersede state statutes. She would have to contact the, the Mississippi Department of Health and find out what their statute is or isn't, sometimes they don't have one. So she can just, she can just practice until she's told she can't. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately that right now, still that's the way it is. But, uh, I, you know, I would suggest that you start with the Department of Health and find out uh, what, what their, what their uh, statute is relating to, I would start with asking about alternative and complementary methods and and then maybe bring it to homeopathy um just so that she's not setting her a red flagging herself you know uh so she could ask as if she's going to to that state and wants to know what it might entail if she lived there and worked there this is why we love you Anne. you always give such practical advice to us so thank you thank you so much and thank you everybody for attending we appreciate being here and thank you, Anne, for all the information that you shared with us. Thank, thank you. you. Take care, everyone.